The last time we looked at sodium ion batteries here on the Just Have a Think channel, there was quite a lot going on in what looked like an increasingly busy and competitive sector. Since then, we've had news of a US bankruptcy filing by Swedish battery maker Northvolt amid stories about how tricky it's proving to make a commercially viable sodium ion battery that can genuinely compete with the overwhelmingly dominant lithium ion technology that's now so ubiquitous in just about every electrical device on the planet. We've examined the technical difficulties with sodium ion chemistry in some detail in previous videos. None of them are insurmountable, but they're not simple to overcome and they make it much more challenging to reach the holy grail of commercially viable and profitable mass production. Now a team at the Argonne National Laboratory in the USA say they've cracked one of the most fundamental of all the constraints on sodium ion cell longevity and they've published a paper to explain their findings. And you know me folks, I do like a nice peer-reviewed research paper. Hello and welcome to Just Ever Think. Apparently a couple of months before Northvolt's bankruptcy filing, China's so-called battery king, a guy called Robin Zeng, was asked why Western battery makers were struggling to make good quality products. He said they have the wrong design, they have a wrong process, and they have the wrong equipment. So almost all mistakes together. Not exactly a glowing reference, was it? And of course, Zeng speaks from a position of considerable strength, given his position as the founder and chairman of China's CATL, who in combination with the other Chinese behemoth, BYD, and South Korea's LG Energy and SK On, now control more than 70% of the global battery market. So finding some sort of breakthrough, or USP, to achieve a foothold in that market and put a dent in what most European and American manufacturers see as a rather unhealthy state of affairs, it's become an increasingly urgent priority for Western governments. Which brings us to this latest paper from the folks at Argonne. The main issue this research addresses is the slightly annoying tendency of cathode materials to develop structural cracks during operation that can lead to a rapid reduction in cell performance over repeated charge and discharge cycles. That issue appears to be exacerbated in sodium chemistry because sodium ions have a larger radius than lithium ions and therefore have a tendency to make more of a nuisance of themselves as they move in and out of the cathode structure. But until recently, no one has really been quite sure about precisely what was fundamentally causing the cracking phenomenon. And of course, if you can't find a problem, you can't fix it, can you? To address that challenge, the Argon team created sodium ion cells using what they called sodium layered oxide cathodes that include transition metals like nickel, cobalt, and manganese. And then they used some very high powered machinery to analyze what was actually happening inside the cathode right down at the molecular level. So first of all, why do battery makers seem to keep defaulting to these metals, some of which have significant environmental and supply issues? Well, it's because they each perform different but very useful functions inside the cathode material. For example, manganese on the surface of a particle provides external structural stability, while a nickel-rich core surrounded by a layer of cobalt offers very high energy density. Cobalt also stabilizes the internal layered structure of each particle, and it tends to reduce the risk of thermal runaway, which means the overall cell can potentially operate safely at higher temperatures. The performance limitation of a configuration like this was thought to be caused entirely by the stresses and strains that built up between the different materials as ions move in and out during charge and discharge. And it's these stresses and strains that were thought to propagate cracks in the material starting at the outer surface and moving downwards towards the core. To assess the problem more forensically and hopefully come up with some solutions, the Argon team constructed two versions of a sodium hydroxide compound that could be used to make the cathode. One version had the additional metals distributed in a gradient similar to the layers I just described, and the other version had the three metals evenly distributed throughout the material. Then they heated the materials right up to 600 degrees Celsius at different heating rates and for various lengths of time before cooling them back down to room temperature. While all that was going on, they used some very fancy Department of Energy facilities to watch what was happening. The first bit of machinery was the advanced photon source at the Argonne lab itself, and the second was something called the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, which is housed at the DOE's Brookhaven National Laboratory. They also used Argonne's Center for Nanoscale Materials and the Polaris Supercomputer to reconstruct X-ray data into 3D images. 
the test results confirmed a somewhat counterintuitive finding. In the sample with the gradient metal configuration, cracks were forming at around 250 degrees Celsius. But instead of starting at the surface and spreading inwards towards the core, which is what generally happens during the electrochemical process of charging and discharging a battery cell, those cracks were actually starting deep inside and spreading outwards. By contrast, in the sample with evenly distributed metal, cracking was barely observed at all. The strong inference was that the distinct boundaries between different metals in the traditional gradient configuration were setting up their own so-called microstrains. In other words, it looked very much like the problem was in large part being created by the manufacturing process itself, rather than the charge and discharge cycles that occurred during the cell's operation. And that was a fairly important piece of insight. But it turned out there was another variable at play too, and that was the rate of heating during the manufacturing process. The test rig was run twice with both cathode material configurations and with exactly the same start and end temperatures. The first run was heated at a rate of five degrees Celsius per minute, and the second was heated at a rate of only one degree Celsius per minute. While the faster heating sample showed particle cracking, no such problem appeared to be occurring with the more slowly heated samples. Now I've greatly simplified the scientific language here as I'm sure you've probably already spotted, partly to keep the video to a watchable length and partly to avoid frazzling my own somewhat limited brain box. If you're a proper scientist though, and you really want the details of Reitfeld refinement results, temperature dependent O3 stacking, heterogeneous microstrain propagation and phase transformation induced stresses, then I've left a link in the description section to the original paper. You will need to be pretty committed though I'm afraid because as is so often the case nowadays, the full text of the paper is protected behind a paywall. Anyway, the bottom line, according to the Argon team, is that there's a pretty simple and almost zero cost solution here to significantly improve the performance and longevity of future battery cells by applying relatively minor changes to the construction of the cathode material. The paper's authors argue that their findings have filled a long-standing knowledge gap in that process and that their test results provide valuable guidance for future development of more sustainable battery materials with high capacity, long cycling life and good thermal stability. That could apply just as well to lithium ion cells or sodium ion cells, or perhaps even to potassium ion cells, which are already in development and may start creeping into the tech media headlines in the next few years. So there we are then folks. It doesn't always have to be complex rocket science, does it? Sometimes it's the simple solutions that prove to be the most effective. Feel free to leave your thoughts and feedback in the comment section below. But that's it for this week. Thanks as always to the folks who support my work via the online Patreon platform, which means I can make these videos without having to bother you with annoying ads and sponsorship messages. And I must just give a shout out to some folks who joined recently with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Stephen Chamberlain, Philip Strong, Tim Mitchell, Adrian Dawson, William Bain, Howard, Sharon Newth, Matthew Peel, Marveen Hamner, and Nicholas Sale. And of course, a huge thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. Don't forget to jump over to patreon.com forward slash just have a think to find out how you can join them and have a look at all the exclusive perks you can get there, including free membership. And if you enjoyed this video, then you'd be hugely supporting me if you could hit the subscribe button on YouTube and click on all notifications. It really does help get us noticed by the all powerful YouTube algorithm doesn't cost you a penny to subscribe, you won't get any annoying spam nonsense from me or YouTube, and it's just a simple click away, either down there or on that icon there. Most importantly though, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.